Okay, thanks very much. I hope we not keep you too long, but there's um, three or four women who are particularly prominent in the War of Independence and in the Civil War, uh, both before and after as well. And there's uh, a lot of comparisons between them and uh, their, their activity and their involvement in, uh, in politics in Ireland, the contributions that they made, um, and how they've been forgotten largely as well. Um, the first woman I'll talk about is uh, Ada English, also known as Adeline English. Um, and she was born actually in Carrasville in County Kerry in 1875 um, and the family moved around a bit because her father was a pharmacist um, but they finally settled in Mullingar uh, when she was a young girl and her father was a pharmacist and a member of the Mullingar Town Commission and her grandfather was the master of the workhouse in Oldcastle, the, the Poor Law Union workhouse in Oldcastle in County Mead so she had kind of a background there in politics and also in realising you know how, how the, the poor and the destitute were treated. Um, as I said, she was reared in Mullingar and she was educated in Loretto um, and she studied in Galway and also in, in Dublin. Um, she did medical studies and she became, she was one of the first female uh, medical graduates of psychiatry in 1903. And she served as a doctor in a number of different places um, in the Matter and Richmond hospitals in Dublin and in Temple Street Hospital as well. For a short while in 1904, um, she had an appointment in London Hospital, but she finally, where she spent uh, all her career really, was as Assistant Resident, assistant resident Medical Superintendent, um, which was a very senior position, at what was then called the Lunatic Asylum in Ballinasloe, the Mental Hospital in Ballinasloe, and she worked there for oh, 30, 35 years. Um, in her work life, she was very important and had, had new ideas in occupational therapy and encouraging um, physical activity and normal social activities and so on um, among uh, the patients there because uh, up until recently, like um, the, the conditions of me mental patients in Ireland were quite deplorable, so her ideas were quite revolutionary for the time. Um, but she was also uh, politically involved in the Irish Volunteers as a medical officer from the start of the Volunteers, and she was a member of Cumann Amman. Um, and in 1916, because she was based in Galway, um, in Ballinasloe, she was involved with um, uh, Liam Mellows. Um, uh, Liam Mellows had a, a, a small unit uh, who had arising in um, Athenry for a week or so and she was a medical officer um, positioned with them uh, during the during the uh, rising. Um, she remained involved, involved throughout the uh, throughout the period before the um, sorry, it's a matter of seeing or not seeing with those. Um, yeah she was a permanent member of Cumann Amman and she was arrested and spent six months in, in Galway prison um, convicted of uh, having nationalist uh, political material uh, but she actually got out, she suffered from a very bad case of food poisoning so she got out after six months, she didn't have to do the whole nine months. Um, in May 1921 she was uh, elected to the unopposed to the second all as an, in the NUI constituency as a Sinn Féin representative. Um, she voted against the Anglo-Irish Treaty. She uh, was very strongly opposed to the uh, to the oath, um, but she felt that like Ireland had all all the risings in Ireland had been against the claim of England's king to Ireland, and uh, she felt that she couldn't support the oath on that basis. But she was one of the few speakers who also spoke out against partition in the Dáil during the treaty debates. She said, the evacuation of English troops is one of the things that has been held up to us as being one of the very good points of the treaty. It would be a very desirable thing indeed that the English troops evacuated this country if they did evacuate it, but I have no life, I can't see it. That's fine. Uh, if they did evacuate it, but I hope that Ulster is still part of Ireland and I have not heard a promise that the British troops will evacuate Ulster. They are still there. I understand they are to be withdrawn from the rest of Ireland. And as I read the treaty, there is not one word of promise in it about the evacuation of the British troops. 
Um, she also um, raised a, a very important issue that uh, had arisen during the, um, during the treaty debates where um, the deputy from Sligo, who was Alexander McCabe, um, he referred to, he, he was very opposed, very supportive of the treaty, and he was uh, very angry that all the women members of the Dáil who had spoken, um, he felt that they didn't have a legitimate reason for being opposed to the treaty. So she said, I think it is the most brave thing today to listen to the speech by the deputy from Sligo, Alexander McCabe, in reference to the women members of Andal, claiming that they only have the opinions they hold because they have a grievance against England or because their menfolk were killed or murdered by England's representatives in this country. It was the most unworthy thing for any man to say here. I can say this more freely because I thank my God I have no dead men to throw in my teeth as a reason for holding the opinions that I hold. I should like to say that I think it most unfair to the women Chakti because Miss McSweeney has suffered at England's hands. Um, that though, I mean, her, her views were ignored, but it was important, I think, to make that she made the point. Um, she stood in the next uh, Dáil election for the National University again in 1922, um, but she, she lost her seat by a small number of votes and was replaced by an independent. Um, she assisted the anti-treatyites during the Civil War, um, and there are very strong reports that she served for Cotter Brew in the Hammond Hotel in Dublin in July 1922. Um, she maintained her opposition to the treaty, and she refused to recognise the legitimacy of the Irish Free State. She continued to work um, into the 1940s um, in the mental hospital in Ballinasloe. She was involved in a number of disputes there where she didn't get promotion because uh, um, a male doctor got promotion ahead of her, even though she had over 30 years seniority and loads of qualifications and so forth. But she eventually won that battle and she served as the, the head doctor in the, uh, in the mental asylum for the last 18 months or so of her career, and she died in 1944. Um, the point was made that uh, by her biographer that she died without leaving a diary, letters, or a will. Her belongings were publicly auctioned, and for seven decades, Ada English vanished from Irish history. Um, she was buried in Ballin the Slow. Um, the only monument or memorial I know of her is on a pub in Mullingar, um, Davy Warren's pub, and that's the building that the family lived in uh, when they lived in Mullingar. But you barely see the, the, the little plaque on the wall, you know. But she's the only one of these women that I know of that has um, a, a memorial to her. Um, there's a lot of links between all these women in their education and uh, the schools they went to and their involvement in coming them on at various stages. Um, another very prominent woman in the same period who was from Westmeath was Alice Cannell. Um, she was born Alice King in 1882 near Mullingar, and she was the eldest of seven sisters. Her father was a substantial farmer and an auctioneer, and he was vice chair of Westmeath County Council from 1899. She was ed educated at the Loretto Boarding School in Navan, um, at the same time, and just a year ahead of uh, Kitty Gibbons, who we, we later talk about, um, they, they were in school at the same time. Um, she spent a, a short amount of time traveling in Europe, working as a governess um, after school. But at 19, she married barrister and nationalist politician, Lawrence Gunnell. She was 19, and he was 30 years, 30 years older than her. Um, she became very, very involved in his political career. Um, I, I doubt very much he'd be, he'd be um, nearly as, as effective as a politician if he hadn't had this, this strong woman in the background running things for him. Um, in 1906, Gunnell became MP for North West Mead and started the cattle driving campaign with the United Irish League, which was the, kind of the end of the campaign to get the huge estates, the grazing estates, divided up among small farmers and, and landless labourers and so on. It was a very important campaign because it was a mass campaign of getting like all the local people out driving cattle, driving the, the landlords and the graziers cattle on the road. Uh, it was really a mass mobilisation. Um, Lawrence Gunnell led this campaign almost alone. Um, 
his other fellow MPs in the United Irish League and the, the Irish Parliamentary Party really wanted to get rid of him, but they couldn't, you know. Um, he was eventually expelled from the party. Um, but as a result of his activity, he was on the run a lot of the time and frequently in prison for short periods of time, went on different hunger strikes. And he was an, you know, an elderly enough man at that stage, into his 60s and so on. Um, Alice wrote columns for the local newspapers and participated uh, in all her husband's political activities. She worked as a translator in London until 1916. They lived in London while he was an MP. Um, and then she visited prisoners under the false name of Mrs. Jones, um, as did her husband, because the prisoners were, uh, after the rising, were scattered in jails all across England. Um, she was active in Coming Amman and the Irish National Relief Fund. In 1917, um, there was a move to set up a League of Women's Delegates, um, and this was formed women from the different Republican organisations. They wanted a representation for women, a greater representation for women within Sinn Féin. Uh, so Alice Gunnell was <coughs> secretary of this league um, in October. That was founded in April 1817, and by October um, they had managed to get nominated to the Sinn Féin executive. Alice was nominated, along with Kathleen Clark, Anya Kant, Jenny Wise Power, Kathleen Lynn, and Helena Maloney. So she was up there with all those um, well-known Republican women of the time. Um, she was also involved in organising Kumanaman branches in Mead, West Mead, Rep Mines in Dublin and other places. In 1920, she stood unsuccessfully um, in the Pembroke Ward in Dublin in the 1920 local elections. Um, so she, she lost by a small number of votes and the seat was won by William Beckett, who was running as a unionist candidate and he was the father <coughs> of uh, Father Samuel Beckett, the, the playwright. Um, in late 1920, the Gunnells were sent to Chicago. Uh, this was partly a way of getting Lawrence I into a more safe position because he wasn't in, in very good health at all. And uh, he it was a good uh, position for a uh, diplomatic kind of activity and fundraising and liaising with Irish America. Um, so they raised a lot of funds for the Dawes, spoke at meetings um, across the Midwest of America. And in late 1920, they were sent, uh, sent to South America and Argentina, which had a huge Irish population. That was in 1921. And actually, they were on, on route, on, on ship to South America when uh, they heard about the truce. And it was at this stage that um, uh, she said that, uh, had Alice said that, had the news come before we left, we would have headed for home and not for South America. Um, but they stayed in Argentina until April 1922, um, where they worked with people like Eamon, Eamon and Anita Wolf and uh, um, raised, uh, you know, promoting Irish Republican issues in, in South America and Buenos Aires. And uh, in 1923, uh, Lawrence Gunnell died quite suddenly when they were in Washington. He just finished writing a book about the, um, about the Civil War and his opposition to the treaty and so forth. And he died quite suddenly. Um, shortly after that, uh, Alice moved back to Ireland and uh, worked in translation work and so on uh, for the rest of her career. And she actually lived until um, until the late 1960s. There was a big long dispute about her uh, entitlement to uh, a, a pension as well, you know, as a result of her activity. But a lot of the time, women's role was ignored in favour of. Uh, the man where she was very much uh, as, as active as her husband, if not more so. Um, no. Kitty Doherty was another uh, interesting person uh, with a, a good Dublin connection there. Um, she was uh, she was born in Terrace Pass in Westmead, uh, around the same time actually as, um, as James Daly. Um, the same town, James Daly, who was killed uh, by the, the British for the Rising in, in um, Dagshire in India. Um, but uh, her, her maiden name was Kitty Gibbons, and her father was a sergeant in the RIC, though he retired early on in the 1900s. Um, again, a, a big family uh, with a great investment in, in education. Um, she was educated, uh, she, she was brought up in Collinstown, 
in Westmead and she was educated with the um, Loretto Nuns, the boarding school in Navan and uh, she became a teacher um, specialising in languages, she translated German for example um, and she worked in various places in, in Belfast in the north and so on where she rapidly lost her job due to organising a, a coming to Mon branch and speaking publicly uh, when that wasn't perhaps an advisable thing to do. Um, uh, she moved to Dublin and was teaching in Dublin and got involved in the Gaelic League and coming to Mon in Dublin and she married uh, Seamus O'Doherty in 1911. He was a, a Derry-born Irish Republican. Um, they lived in Fibsborough and uh, he, was, uh, he was heavily involved in the IRP. And uh, I think very little of IRP activity and practical on the ground work would have taken place without Kitty being sent out to buy like, a lot of the equipment for the rising and the medical supplies and, and raising money and so on. Um, it was uh, their house was, was also used as an arms dump, and uh, she uh, throughout all this time she had six children um, as well uh, as as a very young woman. Um, she was involved after the rising with her husband in in rebuilding effectively the whole leadership of the IRB had died in Kilmainham um, or or during the rising itself and uh, herself and her husband rebuilt the IRB um, while also being involved in um, fundraising for prisoners and so on. And she was involved in the, the start of the election campaigns for Sinn Féin in 1917. Um, it was her actually who came up with the famous slogan, put him in to get him out, in relation to uh, Joseph McGuinness's election in South Longford, the, the first big by-election that Sinn Féin, well, the second that Sinn Féin won. Um, so her husband spent time in and out of prison, but she continued her political involvement and I'm uh, not sure exactly what date, um, early 1920, um, they both went to America and were working in America in the same area, raising funds. She raised massive amounts of money and uh, supplies and so on, um, food and clothing and so on for the uh, families of Republican prisoners which was sent back to Ireland. Um, and she became a frequent contributor to a New York Irish Press newspaper and her husband worked for the Irish Press as the managing editor in America. Um, um, oh yeah, she was sent to talk to Daniel J. Doherty, who had just been appointed at that stage as a cardinal of the Catholic Church and he was the Catholic Archbishop of Philadelphia and it was quite a humorous episode because uh, she explained to him why he should support the, the struggle of the Irish people for freedom and so forth and he said to her, um, now my child would it not be better if you as an educated lady were to take up a teaching career in this city, you might settle down here, you might meet a suitable young Irish American man and set up another Catholic home. And uh, Kitty replied, I have no wish to mislead your eminence, but I have no desire to settle in this country. I am married and living here with six children. Your advice, therefore, scarcely applies to me. <laughs> so she wasn't taking being patronised by the, the Cardinal Archbishop. Um, after the, uh, after the, the treaty and the, the start of the Civil War, the Doherty's remained in America throughout 1921 and into the Civil War period. Her husband was um, was very conflicted by the split within the Republican movement. He did support the uh, he he did support the anti-treaty side, but he wasn't anxious to get involved militarily or, or politically on their side. Um, Kitty, on the other hand, was a really strong supporter of of Eamon de Valera and was explicitly anti-treaty. Um, for example, in July 1922, she smuggled fifty thousand pound in funds into Ireland for the anti-treaty IRA uh, using the cover of visiting her parents back in Collinstown. Um, the family moved back to Ireland and settled in um, settled in the, in the Fibsborough area in Drumcondra, uh, Drumcondra yeah, in 1923. Um, she remained a really strong Athena Fowler and supporter of De Valera. Um, in 1957 she wrote a book about De Valera's fundraising campaign in America. Uh, she's also credited with ghostwriting um, Dan Breen's autobiography, uh, Gorilla, Gorilla Days in Ireland, which is one of the first um, 
first accounts of the War of Independence by a participant, and uh, she helped him write it. Um, she had several other sisters, some of one or two who became nuns and uh, who had very important roles in education as well. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, who do I have left? Kathleen um, uh, Eileen, Eileen McCardle, who was perhaps one of the most interesting women um, involved in the struggle at that time. Um, she was an intelligence officer for Michael Collins. She was born in uh, Rathwire in West Mead, where her father was um, the dispensary doctor for the Poor Law Union, which we saw the equivalent of uh, a doctor dealing with medical card issues in a poor enough area um, in, in these days. Um, I did a bit more research on her beyond what like a lot of people have done out of curiosity because I went to school beside Rat Choir and I actually know the building because a friend of mine's family rented it for a while, uh, the old dispensary building. And the interesting thing about Eileen McGrain, as her, her maiden name was, um, was that she was the, the local registrar for births, deaths and marriages when she was a teenager, about 16 or 17, because she would have been educated and, and capable of doing that job. But the tragic thing was that she had to um, sign, the, sign off on the death threats of both her parents within a year. When she was a teenager, they both died suddenly and the children were raped by her mother's mother, her grandmother. Um, but none of this uh, deterred her whatsoever. Um, she, she studied in University College Dublin, um, and in 1917, John Cumann Amon there, <coughs> she was quickly elected, um, elected captain of Cumann Amon, and was engaged in organizing all the activities and so on. She claims that she met Michael Collins around this time, um, and was involved with him in, uh, raising funds and so forth. Um, she became director of publicity and propaganda for Kuman um, And she also uh, visited uh, visited the North, spent a lot of time in Tyrone and, and um, Armagh and around the Newry area, um, raising, setting up Kuman Amman branches. Um, there's a report about Michael Collins that's quite interesting, was that when he, uh, he encouraged women who were working for him to actually leave coming them on if they had been active in coming them on and to tone down their involvement so they could be more effective, um, well, less prominent and more possible to be secretive as uh, intelligence officers and working purely on his behalf. Um, she rented a flat in, in uh, 21 Dawson Street and this was a very important place. A room in that flat was effectively a government office. Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith worked out of that office. And um, Tom Cullen as well. So, several prominent people in the Republican movement. And it continued on for about a year or so before the British became uh, aware of it. Um, and they raided it on New Year's Eve after the, what, 1920? After Bloody uh, after Sunday. Um, and they arrested, uh, arrested Eileen McGrain. Um, she never said a word about what was in the, the office. There was an awful lot of very important documents, people named, and names of people like Ned Broy, uh, who was one of Collins' agents within Dublin Castle. There was a lot of very uh, serious, um, very serious intelligence taken that was brought to Britain and discussed by the cabinet. Um, and they intended to charge Eileen McGrain with high treason. But this was backed off on perhaps for the reason that they didn't want to admit to having all these documents. And she ended up being charged under the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act, uh, which was, I think it was about five or six uh, revolvers found in the office as well. So she was charged under that. And she was given something like, I think, nine years but uh, that didn't work out what with the, the truce and so forth. She spent a short amount of time in jail in Liverpool and then was moved back to Mount Joy where she was promptly elected as leader of the, the women prisoners there. And uh, she was uh, arrested again during the, during the Civil War. Um, again, she was another one of the women who participated with um, uh, uh, Carl Brewer and other such troublemakers in the, in the Battle of Dublin. Um, uh, some of the Kumana Mon women that she was working with smuggled guns out of Hammond's Hotel and back across the Liffey through all the Free State forces with the 
the uh, machine guns under their clothing where uh, uh, they weren't searched because they generally, a lot of the time, women weren't searched, you know, so that was a one small sexist <laughs> point that helped. Now, just uh, to, to round up there, kind of a, a breakdown, uh, a, a little bit of uh, information about each of those women, but I think what's prominent about them is you look at all their backgrounds, they're all very well educated. It was difficult for anyone to get a secondary education at that time. They all came from pretty well off backgrounds, uh, politically active families like Alice King's family, even though her father was an auctioneer and a uh, county councillor and so on, further back in the family that had been involved in the Fenian movement and so on. Um, so I think from that point of view, like their, their uh, involvement in politics wasn't all that remarkable because they were well educated and well motivated and had grown up through, you know, they, they knew why they wanted a different Ireland. It's interesting that they all remained uh, remained of a Republican viewpoint um, after the Civil War. Um, they participated in the Civil War to, to some extent and uh, still retained their Republican views and so on. Um, so I, uh, after poor Liz has been sitting here listening to me, telling her stuff that she undoubtedly knows, um, we could, I think we should just move on to Kathleen Clark, but with the realization that was just one county in Ireland that had those four prominent women and there are women who happened to come out of those counties and get involved outside of that, but you still had like women like the Leonard women in Mullingar who ran a, a cafe, which was kind of a hub and a central organising point for all Republican activity. And I think that was probably true of nearly every town in Ireland, you know? So it's just like, it may be seen as small things, but there wouldn't have been a Republican movement without women. Uh -huh.